My name's Doug Fridley and I work for Logistics Specialties Incorporated. I'm actually a consultant to the Governor's Office of Economic Development and Procurement and Technical Assistance Center. Um, and before we get started too far, what I'd like to do is introduce Chuck Spence, who is the Utah PTAC Director, and let him make a few comments and then I'll go ahead and get started. So we've got a, a good outreach today and we want to make sure that we keep it within a time limitation to get you out. So Chuck. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. <laughs> now, the applause goes to the Army Corps of Engineers and Hill. We'll do that later. But uh, Doug, thank you. And on behalf of the Governor's Office of Economic Development and, and PTAC, you all know who PTAC is, the Procurement uh, Technical Assistance Center. We're pleased, uh, more than I can tell you, to have you all here. In fact, this is, this is a great turnout, more than we anticipated, and we were setting up uh, extra chairs at the end. Uh, so this is a great turnout, and so we thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedules to be here. Uh, and to our partners, uh, the PTAC team, to Doug, and to, to, to his team, thank you for arranging this. Uh, at the beginning of every year, we get together with uh, our, our, our PTAC team member, LSI, and we, we want you to know that we pay attention to what you say. Your feedback is important. And we, we've asked LSI to coordinate about six to eight of, uh, of these types of uh, events each year, and the PTAC puts on another four or five. And then in addition to that, as you know, we have our big symposium in October, and we have trainings and workshops. And last year, our, our goal was about 38 events. And we are going to far surpass that. So our boss, the Defense Logistics Agency, will be pleased with that. But we, we want you to know that we're trying our very best to create business opportunities here for you. And here in a few minutes, we're going to hear from representatives from the Army Corps of Engineer, from Hill Air Force Base, about construction opportunities, about bids, and what you need to do to find those. And what would be important for all of us is if you can give us feedback, and as you find those opportunities, remember <coughs> that PTAC services are free of charge. Now, I'm a little bit biased because I think that in terms of, you know, government's not real popular these days, but in terms of a government program, uh, I, I think that PTAC is pretty effective in terms of our return on the investment of our taxpayer dollars, which you should be using, and that investment on the contracts that you get. So please, when you find opportunities and you find those RFPs and RFQs and other opportunities, and we realize that uh, doing business with the, with the government's a little more involved, a little more complex, PTAC and our, uh, and our, our staff, we have uh, substantial government contracting experience on both sides. So the PTAC team is, uh, I think, pretty effective, and we want you to use it. And we're doing our best. In fact, uh, PTAC's kind of on a statewide marketing campaign throughout the state, and we've been doing that since about November, December, to get the word out so that you all and, and businesses throughout the state will use PTAC and know who we are. And speaking of knowing who we are, let me just recognize uh, the, the, the PTAC team staff. We'll help Doug recognize his staff. Uh, but for those of you who are on the, who are a part of PTAC, would you please stand up for a minute? <clears throat> we'll start, uh, we'll start in the back. We've got uh, Paula Kramer. Uh, Paula's office is right here in Caseville and she's responsible for uh, Morgan, Weber County, Davis, and Tooele. Did I get that right, Paula? Did I, did I miss out on anything? Uh, Mr. Keith Christensen is my deputy director and uh, he's, he's uh, responsible for the sort of the central Salt Lake and Summit County areas. So if you're in those areas, uh, Keith will be your counselor. We have one who's out of the country in Ghana right now. He covers Utah County. His name's Alex Kwesensaki. And Johnny Wilkinson, who I thought would be here, maybe he's on en route. He covers uh, South Salt Lake, the Sandy, everything from about Murray, Murray South. So use these PTAC counselors, and let's get you, let's get you working on those RFPs, and let's, let's get some uh, co contract awards for you. So thank you for coming, and Doug, uh, <coughs> sorry, sorry to turn you on. Off. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hey, 
say also, just so that I can throw out some recognition, because these things do take a lot to put on, and one of the things that Chuck mentioned was that we listened to you. The reason that this outreach is here is because some of you have been to previous outreaches and you had asked for the United States Army Corps of Engineers with Hill Air Force Base. Well, from that came this outreach. And just after we get done with Michelle and Tim, we're gonna pass out another survey questionnaire. We ask you to please fill those out because that's how we get the feedback and then we'll have Hill Air Force Base do their presentation. Now, in addition to those that Chuck mentioned, we've also got Chase. Chase, if you wanna raise your hand from, go ahead, Mark on with us. Um, <coughs> Kristen and Laurie, thank you so much for the registration, getting the food ready. And because we had so many other people that came, um, you contractors to help us set up the room, thanks for doing that also. Uh, Mike, where are you at? Mike Newton is here with me from our office at LSI from Layton. We've got eight different contracting consultants that have 35 plus years of experience with us. We also have JD, James Dean, that's with the Hill Air Force Base small <coughs> office. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, as we go through this, one of the things that I want to, to make sure that you do is have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, as, as you ask questions, the presenters, so Michelle and Tim and Kristen, if you'll please repeat the question. What we've done, we're going into recording a lot of these because some of the contractors down in the southern part of the state don't have an opportunity to come. So this is gonna be on the Go Ed website, okay? Um, now, having said that, we wanna hurry and get into this. The two, we have Michelle Stratton Morales that came from the Sacramento uh, District Office. She used to work at Sacramento before it was closed in the base realignment and closure. So she worked there for 19 years. And then because of the closure, she accepted a position at the Army Corps of Engineers. And with that, she worked in the small business office and has been the um, deputy ever since then, right over the district, which includes eight different states within the United <coughs> States. They're responsible for $300 million worth of awards annually. For small business. For small business, yes, thank you. So, and you're gonna see a lot of those that she's got together in her presentation. Um, her husband, Daniel, is here. Daniel, thank you for being here with us and her. And then we're gonna have Tim. If you recognize Tim Willard, those of you who've gone through the CE training for certification, it's Tim's crew who comes in here and gives us the two-day training. So I'm sure he's gonna look familiar. Tim has worked in civil engineering for about 30 years. Uh, he's structural engineer, project engineer, an area engineer, an engineer, engineer, every kind of engineer that you can think of. That's Tim. He's awesome. He is, and, and he's done Air Force programs, he's done <coughs> Army programs, he's been, done DLA programs, he's done NSA programs, he's done VA programs, married, he and his wife Laura have five children and eight grandchildren. Um, so we're really glad to have them with us. We'll go through their briefings right now, and Michelle, I'll turn the time over to you. After Tim gets done, we'll have a 10 minute break then we'll come back in and I'll introduce the Hill Air Force Base. All right, Michelle. I'm waiting for my counterpart. <laughs> oh, okay. We're gonna do it together. Great, sorry I didn't okay, have ready? an introduction for you, Michelle. <laughs> so, so, so I wanna introduce, this is Dan Killip. He is the project manager for Hill Air Force Base, right? Yes. Okay, so it, it, he's up here all the time. He manages all of our projects that we have up and coming for Hill Air Force Base. So he and I are going to co present. So, I'm sure you should be good to go. Okay. Up until the time of award, then Tim takes over. <laughs> so, so today we have Tim. Uh, I'm Michelle Stratton Morales. I just got married. Uh, and Dan. So, um, Married life is wonderful. So if you saw Michelle Morales and didn't know it, who it was, it's me. <laughs> okay, so I need you to step back from the podium a little bit. 
There you go. Is that better? Yeah, pretty good. Okay. Please cut my Let me interrupt just a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. I failed to introduce our IT team that's making this possible. Mike Corian for us. If you'd raise your hand, these are the guys that are doing the re recording for us. If you guys have any questions, make sure that you speak really loud. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what you're looking at on the slide, these are all the upcoming projects for Utah. Uh, uh, the first one is the reason that I'm not here <coughs> these, these couple days is because uh, you know we're gathering requirements to create the, uh, the solicitation, the RFP that you guys will eventually see, and uh, the amounts on the right are are not what we think it's going to cost. Um, we, we estimate better than those those gaps. Um, what that is is that's the the far um, federal acquisition uh, uh, requirements that we use. Those are the gaps that we're allowed to tell you before it becomes an active solicitation. <coughs> we can't tell you any closer than that at this point. Um, but if you look, how many how many people are familiar with FBO? Okay, excellent. I was hoping again. Uh, so your FBO skills are obviously important. So um, that is the oh. Federal Business Opportunities. So I, I, I highlight that because you know you might be on there, but you might not be uh, searching correctly or finding the things you need to find. Uh, if you happen to go on in the next week or so, you're going to see the top one on there. Uh, for sources side, small business in this area. Um, and we've already identified that it's going to be a service contract, just to highlight this one as an example. And, uh, so can you explain, I had some people ask me why it didn't say RP or IFB, why it says service? Uh, okay, so service is going to be our, our, our vehicle as opposed to a construction contract where it's going to be a, a supply and install, uh, which we don't do quite, quite many of those, but um, as you can tell by the, the, top, the title, the wall pack lighting. And because this one is so straightforward, it's uh, gonna be remove old lighting systems and replacing them with new LED lighting systems. It doesn't cross the threshold into a construction contract where you're, you know, the rule of thumb, but not always true, is you know, are you breaking ground? So this will be a service contract, which means uh, as opposed to having a uh, technical package and, um, you know, uh, recommended floor plans and design requirements. Um, we're basically gonna give you a quantity and replace, and different plans with different situations, such as you know, replace a 250 watt uh, HID light with a uh, equivalent you know, 68 watt LED light. And you're gonna give us a unit cost for however many hundreds or thousands most likely, uh, of lights. And uh, so that's why it's a service contract because it's, it's structured differently, providing a, a service. Now that I'm actually explaining, it's more like the division of contracting that we use. Um, service contracts are much easier for me to prepare the package, and I would imagine from your perspective it's a lot easier to bid it, because you're just basically pushing out a unit cost. Yes, sir. So that's my question. Does it require the same bonding? Oh, yeah, all the, that, yeah, all the supporting. Any construction? Job? Yeah. Yeah, that, it is. So in essence, for us, it really is a construction and we have to right. approach it with that. I don't know. I have my internal language that I use on a daily basis. A service contract does not require bonding. It's okay. only construction. That's what I was okay. saying. It wasn't construction. So no, it's, oh. you're just doing lighting. It's, not, it's just a service contract. Okay, I don't do a lot of service. So if it's a service, service bonding's not required. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> do you feel, do you, Tim, do you see a lot of service contracts on the AMCS? But we do it in a few. Yeah. yeah. I'm not so sure that they're, made, they're hearing the question in the back. Okay, so the, qu the, the question, question was, is bonding required on service contracts? And unless the overall majority of the contract is construction, the bonding isn't required when it's a service contract. And so for those of you that are active on Fed Biz Ops, you will have already seen uh, the third one, 649 months, energy conservation, uh, precision guided missile stamp. Uh, I think those are the only ones that have been out looking for sources side. And we had a robust response to those, so that's why those are labeled as small business because they we received you know <coughs> no response from everybody in the community to say yes, we can confidently say that the small business community in Utah has the technical capabilities to do this, so we are setting this up. And Michelle's very happy about it. <laughs> um, but this is just the first slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? Well. <coughs> so, Dan, this is uh, the energy conservation project that says TBD right now, but that has been determined it will be set aside for small business? Uh, no. Not yet. Okay. So that, that we, <coughs> said, uh, we, we finished so far are the missiles and the uh, mm -hmm. test bags. Yes. But we're still doing market research on the other ones, so 
Okay. That's where I really want to reiterate about um, our sources thought. Um, if, if, if we call you or we send out a source to SOD or you see anything in FedBiz Ops, um, if you don't want it going out unrestricted, I really need you guys to answer the source to SOD. Even if you're not going to bid it, just answer it and say, hey, I'm interested because if I can get 15 small businesses, or I, I mean, I only have the rule of two, but I mean, if I can just show that I've got enough that have the bonding and when they're construction to push it to a hub zone or woman owned or service disabled vet or 8A, um, if I don't get the responses, then it take we, we <coughs> lose time because then we have to then do internal more market research to try to push it so that it doesn't go out unrestricted. So um, it's really important to answer the source to SOD, and if you think it's too restrictive, if it's too uh, too many questions, write us and tell us that, and so we can help contracting possibly fix it, correct it, or maybe it's that way because it's sensitive or some other things, but please just, it's really important, I've been stressing this for years, to answer our sources SOD. The sources SOD, one, tells you guys about the projects, and two, tells us who can do it, and three, to help us set them aside for small business. And Tim's a really good advocate of helping me with that <coughs> also, so. But yeah, that's why it's like, how we were able to set those aside. We did a industry day at the SBA for the munitions, and uh, we were able to find enough small businesses for that, so it's really important to stay in contact with the SBA. We send them all of the sources of thoughts and to, uh, if you have questions, call us and uh, we will get to you. Okay. Yeah, and, and I would say stay on it all year. Even if you start to get busy, you know, throw an intern on FBO and just have them check it once a week because we had a couple of big projects um, that we put out in September and we got no responses. And we spun our wheels for a few months, and started making cold calls to people, and that's the response that we were getting is, oh yeah, we were just crazy busy. No, no, we want to do that one. So eventually it got out there and was awarded to small business, a big roof job recently. And uh, but it just it just makes life a lot easier for everybody um, if you're if you're on there even even when you're busy because you got you got to you know project and look forward. Um, I was looking around the room. I don't recognize anybody, recognize anybody from the uh, the current General Construction Utah May talk, uh, which is small business. Um, that's what the first line is: is the uh, future plan, um, not anytime soon, but the uh, basically the next iteration of the uh, Utah General Construction uh, May talk. It, planning to move forward again with small business. Um, looking to increase the capacity. Last time it was only 30 million, but we blew through that. Um, so that's our, our tentative, you know, amount that we're gonna go for. And and we do limit that to contractors in Utah and contractors with bona fide offices in Utah. So I've made a promise to the governor's office and to the SBA that the May talks for Utah will be Utah firms. So. Probably going to be four, be four. Or five. I don't know. Yeah, when you, hit, when you hit five, you start having problems where you have to go to Washington, D.C. for approval. Because essentially what a, what a MATOC is, is you're consolidating projects. You're saying, I've got $100 million worth of projects that I'm going to consolidate into a group. Um, obviously, we have a very robust program. Um, but the, the restrictions on cons consolidating in general that apply to the creation of a MATOC have made it more difficult. You have to show, uh, like do additional paperwork to show savings, why you need it, why you're doing it, why you're not just going full and open, or I mean, full to the small business community as opposed to um, a restricted group. Because that, what that does for us is it allows us to operate a lot more efficiently. Um, you know, we're asked to do more with less personnel. Um, a main talk eliminates a phase for us. Um, so all, all of the ones you saw on the previous slide that were small business that were associated with the industry day that we did, our capabilities briefs, those are all two phases. So um, you'll see the, the first phase coming out soon, and, and you know that's that's like a week-long board that I have to sit on for every one of those times two, and uh, it's, it's very time-consuming when you've got you know, 20 uh, acquisitions you're pushing. So that's why I like to at least have some of our capacity <coughs> locked into May talks. Um, 
but that's not going to cover all of our acquisitions. Yes, sir. Question for you. Second one, core. When you verify a company that is 8A or total small business, you guys actually go through the local um, 8A administration or SBA? For Utah? Yeah. Yes. Okay, question for you. For service disabled, better on small business, how do you verify? Well, if it's for Army Corps, uh, it's a uh, self certification. Okay, which means anybody can go on the SAM and say that they're quote unquote service to sale better on small business. The only people who have to go through the one through Washington, D.C. is Department of Veterans Affairs. That's correct. You get your CV, Center for Veteran Enterprise <coughs> Certification. I'm actually uh, asking Sacramento Corps because there is fraud out there that there's been different agencies, because I've been contracting since 1997, did my two tours in the Middle East, and I'm currently in a service disabled veteran small business CV certified with Veterans Administration. All you need to ask for, and I'd like everybody to know, all you need to ask for is a letter of disability rating from the Veterans Administration. 1% to 100% verifies. Yeah, we, I, I'm aware of that. Yeah, have you been, I'm asking you if you can actually do that with Sacramento Corps since you're actually in Utah? Well, well I'm not contracting, and, and all three of us, none of us are the contracting officers, mm -hmm. so. Um, can I get a point I can just contract? speak from, from the market research, at least in the Sacramento region. We do verify. I've never, I've never even seen a response from services. We never meet our metrics, because there's no, when we do, when we're conducting market research, we never get any responses that indicate that this, we would be able to successfully uh, procure a, a contract through, through service disabled. Uh, I'd love to give you a list of the, the veterans that are SDB, BOSB, BOSB here in the state of Utah after the meeting. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is FY18 and beyond. Uh, just highlighting that the program is growing. Um, any questions on any of these? When does that May talk come out? Uh, we are still that one year. What does the one mean? Well, this is FY18, so that won't even start until September. Okay, so, so yeah, that would. So is it'll be an FY18. October. Uh, October. Yeah. So it'll be somewhere October <coughs> to calendar year 18. Did you get It was the same one. Same one. Oh, okay. And this is the title. <coughs> okay. Did I go? You switch There we go. Okay, so this is the some of the other projects out of Sacramento, but not necessarily local. Um, you know, there are other opportunities to be able to work with the same. You'd be able to work with the same people like me <laughs> on some of these. Um, but the Sacramento district spans a, a large region. Eight states. Eight states. Um, I think Utah is the only one that is fully encompassed. Um, do you talk louder and more towards this way so we can hear you? Will do. Thanks. So this, this is just a list of some of our attractive uh, solicitations coming up across the region. Um, again, far uh, dictated price ranges listed. And if you guys are interested in any of this and have a bona fide office in California, you can send us your information and I can uh, get you in contact with the correct PMs. So that's California, not Utah? Yeah, the, the Utah stuff we just did on the previous two pages. So, okay. Yeah, we, we eliminated all of the ones that are already being placed on the Maytox or are going large business for whatever reason. Uh, this is this is all the stuff that's available. Um, <clears throat> quick snapshot. Like the Pier 2s at Motco and Concord. Um. A lot of these are Tracy or right. 400 Liggett down in Paso Robles area. Um, Fort Ord, Camp Parks. Pine Flat, that's kind of out there though. And then moving on to Civil Works, I personally don't touch Civil Works, but uh, it's out there for you to have visibility on. 
Keep an eye out. Stay on pet biz apps. Oh, and others be There you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, another Additional civil works projects they typically have larger price tags. I'm so close. <laughs> <laughs> only if you're only if you're gonna be a rapper, you put her away. So my criteria is right. We're still on the civil works. Okay. This was a product that came out of contracting, I think. We didn't want to touch it because uh, it's a list of all of our small business Maytox and Saytox, some of which we've talked about, some of which I have no visibility on. But but the Maytox for Utah we did talk about. So these would be just general Sacramento district Maytox covering the entire district. So, like for drilling, when that comes out, it'll cover all of the district, not just California or Nevada or Utah. So we just wanted to give you a snapshot. We don't really have any information on these. Uh, we just wanted, if you guys are interested in any of these, just email us. And then um, after that, we have that's uh, the points of contact. And then lastly is uh, SBA in Sacramento, Fresno, and then Utah. Dennis retired, so I don't know if he's been replaced. Uh, I just put Nancy and Suzanne there. So, he, he um, oh, okay. So we have two so businesses. So that means Nancy and Susan are extremely busy. Yeah. Yes. Dennis is off what, writing a book or something, right? Yeah, I got his little email that said he was sailing off to write a book, so. Um, our, Tim, are we handing off to you? We can if you like. Okay. I got one question. Hey, Dan, yes. how can I get your information? I got Michelle's already. It's right on the front page. Better than me. Please contact Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dan? Well, part of the problem is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but I probably shouldn't have, is that I sit on some of these acquisition boards, and so we, we don't want to create a situation where uh, Where we create a situation where a uh, acquisition has become uh, protestable uh, because of uh, communications uh, and that work towards everybody. All right, Tim. Actually, I'm going to just take one minute. Okay. He mentioned, and Michelle mentioned, about you know keeping your eyes on Fed BizOps. And as you know, PTAC has a program called our Bid Match Program, where we are trying to capture through keywords and NAIC codes and regional areas so that you're getting these daily bid feeds on a daily basis. So if you're not getting those sources sought or those uh, set aside for service disabled bid owned companies, get with your PTAC counselor and let's work with Michelle and, and Tim and others. Let's get your get the correct NAIC codes for you because every solicitation is driven by NAIC codes. We'll get those in uh, into your uh, search profile so that you're receiving these types of notifications. All right, Tim. Yay. the Corps of Engineers, maybe out of the Utah local office, raise a hand. So a pretty small number of you, that's good because what I have to say is not news to you, it's old hat, so you know, take a break, whatever you want to do. But for those who have not done work, um, uh, what, what my presentation is about is, um, uh, there we go particularly about some of the unique things that you would find in a construction contract that you probably need to be aware of, and if you were not aware of, they would tend to cause you some grief uh, during a construction project. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the Sacramento District, um, uh, 
Located here in Sacramento is where our district office co uh, is, comes from. The Utah resident office covers all of Utah. We've done work in Colorado, uh, a little bit up in Idaho. Uh, for the most part, that's pretty much the boundary that we stay within. Our primary customers are Hill Air Force Base, Dugway Proving Grounds, Tool Army Depot. We do work for the uh, Reserve Center at Fort Douglas. And over time, we've also done work for the VA, Camp Williams, and the NSA. Uh, what I wanted to talk about was construction quality management. And um, uh, CQM, as we call it, is the performance of tasks which ensure that uh, construction is performed according to the plans and specifications on time to define budget, safe work environment. And the issue with that is the Corps of Engineers believes that we pay for construction quality management just like we would pay for brick and mortar. Um, there's some of the pertinent principles in CQM that you probably ought to be aware of is that we require a construction quality control plan. Uh, we, provide, we require specific construction management staff. Uh, we follow a three-phase system inspection. Uh, scheduling is very important to us. Uh, safety is obviously very important. Um, we use some specific uh, Corps of Engineers software that you will need to become familiar with. And um, all of our jobs are rated uh, through, uh, it used to be uh, CCAS, now to CPARS, where you receive an evaluation based on your performance. That performance goes in well, I'll get that in just a second here. So as far as the construction quality control plan is concerned, uh, that plan is required to, in an effort to get the contract to plan the work, plan and schedule work. Um, it helps you to manage your own, uh, your own self perform work, as well as that of your subcontractors and suppliers. And uh, that plan is used to uh, manage inspections, testing, and submittals, and efficiency tracking type issues. Um, in each of our contracts, they vary depending on dollar amount and complexity. But uh, as a minimum, typically, it's required that it is superintended full time. That means that any time work is going, we require a superintendent to be on the job. It also requires you to have, typically, a site safety and health officer that is on the job any time work is going on. Uh, we also require a, um, a construction quality control manager, uh, and that person is there managing the quality control program. So those three individuals on a typical project, particularly over a million dollars, is required to be on staff full time. Now depending on the complexity of the job and how large it gets, we may specify other unique specialties. Maybe we need a mechanical engineer, maybe we think we need electrical engineers, or maybe we need a controls engineer, or whatever the case may be. Those would be specified in the uh, solicitation in the project requirements. And the Corps of Engineers requires those people to be on the project anytime work is going on. So if you're not familiar with that, you may find that all of a sudden you've got a job and you're having to throw people on the job you didn't anticipate your budget for. So you need to be aware of that. <clears throat> the three-phase inspection, uh, the, the, the Corps believes that the uh, quality of the job and inspection is the full responsibility of the contractor. Is not that of the government. And so as a result of that, um, uh, we require a, the work to be broken in and definable features of work. Concrete, steel, electrical, interior, electrical, exterior, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of an idea. And we go through this three-phase inspection process on each of those definable features of work. Uh, they go through a preparatory inspection, initial inspection, follow-up inspection process. Uh, scheduling is another one that might uh, uh, catch you if you're not prepared for that. Uh, Primavera is the only software that meets our requirements, so you need to be familiar with Primavera Project Scheduling or have a uh, resource to do that type of scheduling. Uh, scheduling is required, an approved schedule is required before any payments made, and we make progress payments based on schedule, so we track schedule very aggressively. Uh, safety, uh, we use the Corps of Engineers EM385-1-1 as our safety manual. Uh, that safety manual is equivalent to or many times more stringent than the OSHA requirements. Um, our projects require an accident prevention plan to be in and approved for project-wide. And then as I mentioned on those definable features of work, uh, an activity has to announce, which is kind of customary for most. Uh, it has to be prepared, reviewed, uh, and uh, uh, accepted. Uh, at, before we begin each definable feature of work. Uh, the software, we use a software called uh, Resident Management System. Uh, QCS is the contractor version of that software. 
what the software does, it really just feeds the government the information they're looking for. It keeps us happy. We use it for financial management, uh, for uh, payment, submittal management, RFIs, deficiency tracking, daily reports, and testing. Um, <clears throat> the unfortunate thing about the software is that if you don't have a contract or haven't had a contract at the current moment, there's really no way for you to get the software to practice it. So if you're getting a job for the first time, uh, you need to plan on a little bit of effort to come up to speed. It's not really difficult, but you would need to plan on some time to do that. Uh, the CPARs, uh, uh, Contractor Performance Assessment Reports, um, if you have a project longer than 365 days, uh, we provide an evaluation annually. So if you have a two-year project, you'll get one at midway and you'll get one at the end. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this evaluation, um, we specifically address quality, schedule, management, uh, regulatory requirements, <coughs> safety comments. And they're evaluated in those categories as being either exceptional, very good, satisfactory, marginal, or, or unsatisfactory. Now, this, now the CPARS evaluation is also used if we have projects that go south to provide motivation because these um, evaluations go into a database that our contracting folks then will pull from on a solicitation if you provide a, a, an RFP or respond to one. They will pull up any previous work that you've done and if you've got a, a good evaluation you obviously float to the top as far as being more technically qualified. If you've got less than satisfactory you obviously are dropping to the bottom of the pile. So very important and very critically understand uh, that um, CPARS, critical for follow-on work. And I believe that's really all I had, unless anybody has any questions. Very good. Here's yes, sir. The, the past performance is a big deal, but a lot of us are small, small companies that don't have, I mean, that's the reason why we're small, because we don't have a lot of past performance. That's correct. So it's kind of a catch-22 there. You're, you're right, it is. And I don't know how they handle that in shell. But, but you can use other experience. It doesn't have to be government experience. Right. Sure. And typically, they will ask for that, yeah. Sure. There's also joint venture opportunities and, and partnerships that you can go to to build, help build your, just like credit report. Credit. You've got to build up your credit rating, if you will. And, and, and then, of course, in an RFP, as you're responding to it, that's where you can build some of that uh, work experience and past performance into and then the only other thing I want to address, uh, everybody understands what a MATOC is? By a show of hands, I mean, if you don't, I I'll just cover just a little bit because it didn't really, it's multiple award task order contracts. So what they do is they award a contract to up to four or five contractors that are, that are sort of like on a retainer, so, sort of like concept, so that when a scope of work comes out and we can, we can develop that scope quickly, uh, then we can send it out to those four contractors without doing any other advertisement, uh, receive proposals for them, and then, ne then negotiate the cost and execute a contract. So it's a much faster contracting mechanism when we can work out on the street. Typically, we pound the main talk really hard at the end of the fiscal year when uh, the Air Force and the Army's <coughs> money start trickling in, extra money that hasn't been spent that they need to spend before the end of the fiscal year, and so it creates a, a, a mechanism that we can award very quickly. Um, I don't know what, uh, do, you, do you by any chance know where we're at on the capacity of the current May talk? It's, it's done. We're done, so we've, we've, we've capped out. We capped the Utah yes. And that happened in, I don't know, I, I think I have some people here years. on part of the May talk, what, it's been out two years? Less than two One years. One year? Less than two years. So the 30 million in less than two years, hence the 100 million, right? <coughs> uh, the other thing that you want to be aware of is we do, do two, particular, we do service, some service contract work, uh, not very much. Uh, the rest of them are either design bid bill type contracts or they're design build contracts. So, very good. Thank you, Tina. So, um, what, the one thing I, I, I forgot to mention was that um, Albuquerque District, San Francisco District, and the Sacramento District, which are three of the four, Los Angeles has already had theirs, are having open houses. Um, Albuquerque's is next Thursday in Albuquerque at their district <coughs> office. It's uh, March 30th. San Francisco District is having an open house on April 11th. And the Sacramento District is having an open house on May 23rd at the Grand on J Street. It, uh, the San Francisco District uh, one on April 11th is at the Bay Model in Sausalito, beautiful Marin County by the Golden Gate Bridge. So uh, if you want to Come visit San Francisco. 
So the one in Sacramento on May 23rd is at the Grand on J Street. So I just want to tell you, so those are the meet the districts. Um, all the divisions will be there. All the project managers will be there for all of the divisions. So um, if you're interested in those, uh, just shoot me an email and I will uh, get you the information for those open houses. So I didn't mean to cut in on your time. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Uh, is that working now? A little yeah. bit? I counted it in. Is it, can you hear me better this way or this way? Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, so as we get along here too, Dan was just reminding me or letting me know as we talk about the NICS code, typically in PTAC when we bring you in and we start narrowing down what you do, <laughs> we try to get the, the specific <coughs> NICS codes that your, your Spire service is. But what Dan was saying, they, theirs is pretty, pretty general. So they listed in three primary, or three NICs. So it's very broad. You'd need to take a look at those and make sure that you just don't pass them by. So when you meet with one of your regional managers like Keith or Paula, make sure that um, you let them know that same thing, that you want to be aware of all of them. There's a good and a bad about that. Because when you get on this bid match and you've got an uh, a NICS code that's very broad, you could be getting 50, 60, Chuck, a lot of emails saying these are the requirements that are out there. But again, this is just another toolbox that you're going to be able to take a look at. If you want it to be very generic or very specific, then you might be eliminating yourself from some of these programs that they have. Okay, now, um, after Kristen gets done also, I've asked J.D. if he'd just take a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about the small business or kind of wrap some things up for us so that you know what's going on with the rest of these guys. I retired from Hill about a year and a half ago and I was over operational, con well, in enterprise contracting, which included comp complex and installation. Um, Blake, raise your hand. Blake now is the chief over operational installation base, whatever you want to call it. He's the guy that's over that contracting. Hand again. Right? Maybe you better stand, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> so Blake is the chief that's over, and again, it used to be operational, and it used to be base. So the current buzzword is installation, but they still use operation. So, and Blake has been in, oh man, space and C3I, MAPA, supply chain. So he's got a lot of experience in central as well as operational. Um, Adam, if you'll stand up. Adam Jerkowitz also is the section chief that's over the CE support. These, he's responsible for, like Michelle had $300 million worth of contract, contracting actions to small businesses. Um, his team actually has 300 contracts that they're annually responsible for. And um, Adam, you've been in munitions and supply chain too, right? And Adam was part of you, if any of you were with us about eight months ago, we had supply chain management come in and do an outreach as well. So thank you. Now with um, Kristen, Kristen Soaker, she's the buyer and she has an unlimited warrant. She's got seven contracting officers that report to her. They're the ones that put the contracts on with the requirements that they've got going out. And, darn it, sorry you guys, I keep coming too close up. Huh? Um, so, as we go through this again, listen to the requirements that these guys have, and please take the time afterwards to meet with the Hill Air Force Base team that will be back there, and JD, maybe if you could join them. And then, Michelle and Dan and Tim, if you guys could be up there. Please. Doug just mentioned about these NAIC codes and those three <laughs> NAIC codes that the uh, Corps uses. Dan is writing them down as we speak. What we're going to do is take those three NAIC codes, we're going to put them on our website. And then all you have to do is to go to the website, get those uh, NAIC codes, and then work with your regional managers to get those into your bit match search profile, okay? Any questions on that? Terrific. Thanks, Doug. Okay, so as mentioned, um, I'm the team lead over part of the construction services at Hill Air 
Force Base. Um, our mission is to support the base. Some areas that we focus on or locations are the base itself, Little Mountain, Dugway, uh, Boulder Seismic Station, Utah Test and Training Range. And what we do at those locations is A&E projects, engineering or abatement, epoxy flooring, regular flooring like your carpet or your uh, vinyl flooring type contracts, paving, painting, and uh, roofing. The way we issued the uh, work our contracts at the base is through various contract vehicles. One of them is our multiple award construction contract, three. It's our third iteration of this contract at Gill. Um, then we also have the Saber contract, which is the simplified acquisition based engineer requirement contract. We issue IFBs, which is invita invitation for bids, request for proposals, RFPs. And as part of that, um, in construction, in accordance with the FAR, there is a 15% um, cost minimum that the prime, contr prime contractors um, should retain that portion of work. Uh, last year, in fiscal year 18, Hill Air Force Base um, completed 344 contract act 345 contract actions for a total of $885 million. Um, MAC-3, that's, um, as I mentioned, our our multiple award construction contract. Uh, we awarded that just last September, and it's a five-year ordering period, which is which will expect it, which will expire in 2021. Um, in order to get that contract uh, on the street, out for bids, and go through the source selection process, that process was roughly two and a half years. So hopefully that got, will give you guys some information as we go through the next two and a half years when he'll get ready to hopefully start the new process of looking for interested vendors <coughs> and um, industry days and doing the market research in order to support that requirement. Um, that requirement and is also is 100% small business set aside. Uh, multiple award, there's currently six contractors on that contract that it was awarded to under the next code listed. The contract value for that uh, MAP contract is $150 million, and um, the average or magnitude of scope that they anticipate on it is $750,000 to $5 million. This, the, the MAP contract is supposed to support more of the complex um, projects that Hill does, and which can include architect engineering and also up to 100% design. Um, as I mentioned, I guess all the charts and everything will be available, but this is a list of the who the contracts were awarded to um, for our prime contracts for MAC. <coughs> so as, as I mentioned, um, MAC contract takes our uh, more complex projects. On our past MAP contract, one of the projects they did was for building 55 and 62. This is for the F-35 mission, and as part of that, they needed to take building 55 and 62 and make it into one building, and then they also had some additions to add on to that, and a roof repair. So again, it was it was more complex than what our Saber contract could, could handle. Um, currently, some, some awards are uh, requirements that they're working is for building 510, which is an isolation pad for the milling machine. It was a 35% design. Uh, they had to demolition the existing concrete, concrete pad and had the construction for the new pad. Uh, and another one that they're, they're working is building 100 Bay A repair. This was a 5% design. They had to demo a complete um, renovation of, of this space. So, and the square footage was 14,000 square feet. So that just hopefully gives you a, a synopsis or an idea of what projects and requirements that are gonna typically be issued under the MAP contract. As I mentioned, we have a SABER requirement and um, this was also recently awarded last September with a five year ordering period uh, expected to end in 2021. We had some 
lessons learned that we are able to take from the MAC requirement of going through that source selection process that we can implement into the SABRE requirements. So you'll notice a short duration time for the source selection period of being two years from the time it was started to the time we were able to get it awarded. Um, this one is an 8A competitive set aside, so it's been narrowed down even smaller into the small business realm. Also, this has a $150 million contract value. And again, this is more for our non-complex requirements, minimum design up to 35%, and some updating of other old designs. The contract, uh, when it was awarded, there was three awardees, and these are those contractors. Question for you. Like okay. Michelle said, this, co this contractor, <coughs> Whiskey 4 or W4, they had to have a bona fide office here in the state of Utah, then, correct? Um, for Hill Air Force Base, no, that was not part of our requirement, okay, as far so as I understand. And I wasn't part of the source selection team, so unfortunately, I don't know what those requirements were. Okay, thank you. Um, so, to give you an idea of what past projects they've done in Hill, they did a building. Building 100 renovation, and they had to demo with the existing ceiling and construct new storage. Uh, it was only 4.3 million dollars. That sounds so funny when I say 4.3. I apologize. Um, and it took eight independent construction projects, and they went into one in this in this area. Another one that we're we're recently working is. Uh, for the fan camp, they needed to do some updating to the area of the concrete RV pads and electrical and plumbing in that area. And it was awarded for $535,000. And then for building 503, this was to renovate some restrooms on base, new sinks, painting, new slides, new stalls. And that was $393,000. So hopefully that gives you a kind of a synopsis of where we're at, what we're looking forward to. But because um, our contracts, we have these multiple award construction contracts, we go through our primes and then our primes are hopefully then can reach out to you or they have things set up to, to get their subs in. Uh, we don't have any privity over the subs and how that all part works. Um, if it is an IFB, um, it's just, it's posted out on, uh, uh, oh, let me get on the next one. Uh, Federal business opportunities, as everybody has mentioned, and NAICS is selected. Um, and one of those recent projects was our for our golf course clubhouse. And it's a new clubhouse on the base, 12,000, just over 12,000 square feet, and replacing piping, utilities, and it was a four and a half million dollar requirement. Another one that uh, went out on an IFB was for a fire alarm system for building 238. And that ended up being awarded for $696,000. Um, so, like I mentioned, those were multiple award contracts. Then the other contracts that we have are other IDIQs that we went out and competed and issued to a single awardee. And um, typically those contracts are running five years. One of those contracts is for the abatement contract, which was issued in June of 2015, and it's planned to expire in 2020. And uh, the ceiling of that contract is $8 million. And as well, we've listed the, the contractor who that was awarded to. Uh, we have fencing requirements. Uh, we tried to, use, again, we utilized the IDIQ. This was issued in November of 2014 for $8 million as well. And uh, was a small business set aside. Um, the Air Force is going to a way of setting up some enterprise contracting um, that all bases are man that they're mandatory to use these, these these bigger contracts that are set up. One of those is the enterprise roofing contract, and what sets us apart with some of the other things is anything that our government estimate comes up with over one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's a mandatory use that we use this contract. Um, it's a it's like. $900 million or something. I don't remember the, the total contract value. Um, it's awarded to various regions and within each, or it's awarded to various contractors and then they're set up in regions. And we're in the West region. 
And this contract is set to expire, oh, 80 million, excuse me, not 900 million, I apologize. It's set to expire in May 2020. And so um, these are those contractors that are set up in the West region. So when we have a requirement that comes out again, over $150,000, we issue TOPERS to, which is a task order proposal request to these contractors, which was set up, set up as an enterprise contract. Um, we needed something to capture anything under $150,000. So we set, we set up a small um, local contract for anything that was under $150,000. That was awarded to a single um, contractor uh, for $4.5 million last September, and it's set to expire in 2020. And that is the contractor there. Are these slides going to be available? As far as I understand, yes. Yes, they will. That's why we need everybody to get with Kirsten or Larry, though. To make sure that you get your emails. And just to be sure, <laughs> we can put these on the uh, PTAC website, too. So. Um, and again, to mention some of the other requirements that we're doing is epoxy floor. Again, if we need quick uh, utilization uh, contract vehicles. So that's why we set up a lot of things with IDIQ requirements. We go out, we set up some source selection criteria. And a lot of times we're using the lowest price technically acceptable. And you have to meet those technical capabilities to, and then also your price at the end, be awarded the contract. Um, some of the future projects that we have coming up is the epoxy flooring. Um, I believe there is a RFI out on the street. I don't remember the, uh, the, the solicitation number for that that they're using. Um, but that is out there. We're also going to be having a general flooring contract uh, come up, with, which is anticipated to be a five-year IDIQ, 100% small business set aside. And next, we have a painting requirement. Uh, it, it's looking like it will be an 8A direct award, or sole source requirement, and um, go from there. Next, which is another big contract, looking at a multiple award contract, is our paving requirement. This is anticipated um, to be out in the next little bit. They've already started some market research posting under the, the solicitation number there and going forward. Uh, we have an a and &E requirement that uh, is well. We've already posted information out on FBO. We're anticipating six six awardees on that contract and um, with an estimated ceiling of 100, uh, with $15 million. Excuse me, that paving IDIQ you're talking about, yes, sir. isn't that already in the pre-solicitation? It's out of the market <coughs> research? Um, as far as I know, last week they were posting a draft solicitation for vendors to come back and provide comment for. We're not working that. My office, a different office, is working that. We try to stay close hand in hand and <coughs> having an idea what's going on. Um, but market research typically is the way we understand it at the base is it's always ongoing. And uh, the official solicitation of the wheel has not been issued. So right now they're just looking for comments currently. Looking at your uh, PowerPoint presentation from, from Hill, I noticed that you have for your IDIQ, small business set aside in eight days. I don't see anything for disadvantaged small business, woman owned small business, service disabled veteran owned small business, veteran owned small business. Why is that? Um, I don't specifically work each one of those requirements. And as far as I understand, the market research that was presented that there was uh, just the small business set aside that that's what they came down to. Okay, so that's the majority that got back to you then? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, with, the, with our construction requirements, I think it was touched on earlier, was bonding requirements. There's bid bonds, there's performance bonds, and payment bonds. And so just make sure that um, when these solicitations are coming out, that you are submitting your bid bonds back because that could be uh, a reason to, what's the word, eliminate you from the competition um, or because you didn't meet the minimum, you were not compliant that way. Does that make sense? 
So just make sure you read these solicitations really carefully. And it is very important, um, as mentioned earlier, when we're going out for market research and searching for various, uh, in our sources thoughts or getting these RFIs or the draft solicitations out, we want comments back from the industry. Does this work, doesn't work? And it can help us build a better product, not only for you as contractors, but us as the government to, to make sure that we're meeting our mission. And then our small business representative that's local to base is Mr. James Dean. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you talk about the bid bonds again? When is that required? Is it required on every? So on most of our construction requirements, there will be the FAR Clause 52 228-1, I believe. And um, it, it's usually, if we've, done about 20% of the contract value. And so you'll just have to carefully read those solicitations. That clause is typically found in section K, I believe. So if the response doesn't include the bid bond verifications and you're eliminated for it? Possibly could be. I'm not saying that you are, but um, there have been instances that uh, that if you would not have not submitted them, it could have it depends on where in this where in the evaluation criteria that falls. is how historically has been bought in the past as well. So you, you'll see a lot of our IDNQs are, are follow-ons from previous one. Uh, the Sabre contract will always be 8A because I've got to do the 8A program. <coughs> uh, some of the other ones, the, the paving is just a small business contract. Uh, the market research one leads to competition in that arena. And also when we start limiting the way it was done in the past, if I were to say, hey, hey I got two women owned, I'm going to set it aside this time. Well, the people that were getting geared up to bid for that may lose that opportunity. So I want opportunities to happen as well. But if anybody has any questions on act strategies, feel free to come, come see me. Um, <clears throat> wanted to, uh, first I want to validate, it's validating with the uh, operational sense because all you guys are coming to see me, I feel bad. I says, we don't have a lot of standalone construction projects for you to come bid on and stuff like that. And I was worried, what are they going to come brief about? Because it's the same stuff that I tell everybody. So uh, being consistent, I do want to footstop um, a big piece about sources sought that Michelle uh, led to. Without your input, we don't make these, uh, these decisions. That was part of my briefing I gave it to, to a conference yesterday. I did a whole hour on how industry affects market research or acquisition strategy. And it all depends upon your responses and your capabilities. Um, a, lot of, a lot of responses of source aside, uh, people send in their capability statement, their CAN capability statement, and don't address the issues that are asked in the source aside. So that's not leading you, them to that confidence rating of, hey, they can do this job without them having to come back to you and ask for more information. So if you're responding to source aside for a specific project, make sure you're addressing the questions. And I know it takes time and it takes money, and like Michelle said, I'm in the same capacity as she is. If it's overburdensome, you think that they're asking for too much information, go ahead and let us, let us know so we can help address that situation. But there are times where we're, we're making them go out and get that market research to, so that they can't justify not doing a set aside. We'll send them back for more information, more times than we accept what they give us. And the whole row of operations going back here, yep, he does that too. Because, <laughs> um, you know, 
Our customers have a mission, and that's their goal. Our mission is to promote competition. Ideally, it's in a small business arena, but the market research tells us which way it goes. So even though I'm always advocating small business, if that market research doesn't tell that story, I'm gonna let the mission go and succeed the way the market research says. Um, for those, I didn't have slides up, but everybody knows or can get a hold of BTEC, get my information. Um, again, it's very validating to hear the same stories I've been telling everybody for the last four years. <laughs> It's like, oh, they go tell them something, I don't tell them. But, uh, and I don't know, if you, were you going to wrap it up, Doug? Or Chuck, yeah. or, but uh, if anybody had any questions for me directly, I'll, I'll be hanging around. And uh, or most of you know where my office is anyway, but you guys will all come and see me. So thanks. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, I got him on the spur of the moment. It's great looking down here. There's a lot of contractors here, so thank you. Chuck reminded me, too, to, to let you know. If you've got questions, just like J.D. and Michelle and everybody are talking about with sources sought or industry days or anything like that, that, again, is one of the free services if you sign up to be a PTAC, represent, or a PTAC contract or client. So take that time, okay? Now we're going to go ahead and break and... If you so feel inclined or you want to get this networking, which I would encourage you to do, please meet with these individuals. You guys from Operational Contracting, thanks a lot much for being here and great presentation. Kristen, you'll be in back and again, Michelle, Dan, and Tim will be up front. With that, maybe one more round of applause for these guys at this point. Thank you.